And if you notice, the person involved, Larry, is it Larry Lasker? Larry Lasker. Larry Lasker is involved with... The Larry Lasker is... The... Okay, everybody shut up now. <laughs> Larry Lasker, he wrote or produced? He uh, wrote. He wrote. And he was also involved in sneakers. Yeah, he, uh, Larry Lasker. I'll be referring to Larry Lasker and to Walter Parks probably through a lot of this. And, uh, and Larry, and they both I, are the screenwriters for War Games and for uh, Sneakers. And for a while I heard Larry was trying to do a third movie to sort of finish off like a triad of movies that kind of dealt with issues of hacking. I don't know if he's ever written a, a screenplay, but I heard that several years ago. He came to DEF CON maybe four or five years ago, and nothing really came of it. But he was wandering around here checking us out. Um, but it's strange that the same guy is involved with two of the best movies that depict hacking. And I think that's probably because he focused also on the human element of it more mm -hmm. than the super flashy, you know, fly through the air and shoot bullets upside down. Um, so how did he come across you? Or how did you two even meet? All or right, well, tell yeah. us a little bit about why you're even qualified to be sitting here. I, okay. That sounds <laughs> fine. Well, first of all, I'm David Scott Lewis. And I came here uh, just for DEF CON all the way from China. So there's probably be some interesting questions about yeah. that as well. Uh, China certainly plays an interesting role in this community uh, for various reasons. Um, let's see. So what, I, what happened in, in my time, I'm 50 years old now. I turned 50 this year. <laughs> and, and we actually started working on the screenplay for War Games in the first quarter of 79. So next year would make 30 years where we started actually on the uh, screenplay. And the original idea that Larry and Walter were kicking around was in uh, 78, and it was a little bit of a different model. They were looking for somebody who was a Stephen Hawking with a protege. So that was the original concept. That was something that Larry was really pushing. It had nothing, nothing to do with hacking and the original, uh, the original thought that they were going to have. They wanted to have this Stephen Hawking guy who kind of had the unified field theory but couldn't really communicate it. So it would have a, a, a protege, young kid, and that would, that's how they were going to take it. So um, my background prior to that is uh, probably like a lot of people in my age, those of you that are in the 50s or so, you took shop class in your seventh grade. My best shop class was electronics. Took advanced uh, electronics in the ninth grade. Like a lot of you here that, again, in my age group, you have ham radio licenses. You had ham radio licenses. So I was a novice. I was an advanced. Had a rig, two meters, mostly doing two meter stuff. Built a Newtonian six-inch telescope when I was in the sixth grade. And then, of course, the January 75 issue of Popular Electronics, the one we all know about. Now, back then, uh, I never received popular mechanics, but I did receive popular science. I used to kind of think that was going to be the future. Now I kind of realize popular science is really science fiction that's just <laughs> sold as f science fact. Uh, but it was fun. It was inspirational. You know, a lot of these things that turned out to be totally bogus uh, really turned out to be very inspirational for me. So, so anyway, so I had my um, ham radio going on. Uh, this is also during the Apollo program and such, so I got into astronomy at that point. And I can remember exactly what I was doing when Neil Armstrong touched on the moon. Exactly what I was doing when that happened. Exactly when it was and the whole bit. So that's a vivid memory for me. And that had a profound influence on me. Uh, 2001 had a bit of an influence on me as well, uh, as you might think. But you know what was interesting about 2001? When you look back at it, and Arthur C. Clarke being one of the best hard SF writers, uh, but it was basically all wrong. No orbiting weapons platforms, no moon bases, no manned trips or human trips to Jupiter. HAL is probably no closer today than it was back then, and all the astronauts and cosmonauts were white. So think of somebody that was probably one of the best science fiction writers and how wrong he was. Now, so the movie that really I find, uh, found inspiring, though, even back then was The Andromeda Strain even though I had really no interest in molecular biology or biochemistry. I'd just like to point out that while I lived in Seattle and the, you guys decided to nuke Las Vegas, I lived in Piedmont, which is the first town to die in Andromeda strain. I do remember that. <laughs> Piedmont, New Mexico, population 68 or something. Yeah. 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 So the Andromeda strain was, uh, was more influential on me. I used to read Analog Magazine. Back then, the Isaac Asimov didn't have his magazine. So Analog Magazine was my favorite, and that was more of the hard SF uh, 
magazine, Red Sky and Telescope, of course. Uh, Future Shock was probably the most important piece of fiction to me. And again, look back at Future Shock. Toffler was probably 95% wrong in what he said. All right? As a futurist, he just totally blew it. But it was inspirational. So notice that. Popular science, wrong. Inspirational. Future shock, inspirational. Even though they really kind of just missed the mark on what really happened later on. So, Larry and Walter were kind of looking for somebody. We had mutual friends of the William Morris Agency. I was living, in, I was raised in Los Angeles. So we had mutual friends of the William Morris Agency. And somebody who was handling one of them, um, actually Jimmy Kahn's, the actor, Jimmy Kahn's brother, uh, Marty Kahn, uh, his admin was a friend of mine. So they were kind of saying, well, we need somebody that's kind of like into astrophysics. So I happened to be kind of, at that time, into astrophysics. So I kind of, because they wanted this Stephen Hawking kind of thing. So we met, and uh, I remember the first dinner we had and so on. With my Jennifer, by the way, uh, my Jennifer was actually, oh, by the way, I wasn't the inspiration and you said John. I was actually the model for David Lightman. What, and that's, that's probably an important distinction. The inspiration was really this, this character that never happened because it was that Stephen Hawking protege that really didn't materialize in the movie. So there really was no inspiration, if you know what I mean, because it didn't really materialize that way. So I was the model for David Lightman. And then together with them, we helped them with the screenplay. So we kind of worked out the stories. Uh, so anyway, so my Jennifer was with me, and I was with that that particular woman for 11 years. We were high school sweethearts, and we were together actually for 11 years. So um, anyway, so we met, and then I kind of told him about, hey, well, let's look at what we can do breaking into stuff. So I said, well, let's do that, and, uh, and finding information and so on. So back then, they thought it was a big deal, but I was using Dialogue and Orbit, which were kind of, you know, not too many people were using them back then. I even remember my, uh, my idea count on Dialogue was like a 10,000, so it was pretty low. Uh, so I was using Dialogue and Orbit and BRS and getting all the information. They were pretty amazed that people could even do that. So, and I didn't think it was much of a big deal at all. So, and then just showing them hacking. Now, one difference between myself and, and David Lightman, uh, I would say a significant difference, is that I wasn't probably as much into gaming. Gaming was important to me, but it wasn't as important as it's driving force. It wasn't a driving force. I was actually in high school. I was a member of the United States Strategic Institute, and then the uh, Armed Forces Communications and Electronics Association (AFCSA), and also the Association of Old Crows, which is the Electronic Warfare Society. Uh, there's a long story behind that and what happened and so on. But nevertheless, I was more into defense and what was going on. AFCSA had a fairly active chapter at SAMSO's headquarters, which was in El Segundo in Los Angeles. And guess who the Blue Cube, who they break into in the movie, reports through to SAMSO back then. Okay? So this is all tied in together. Uh, also, uh, the Old Crows was at the Old Hughes Aircraft Facility in uh, Culver City. So that was also in Los Angeles. So I was active in all that stuff. So I kind of knew that. So I was kind of like a... You know, because I did a ham radio stuff, I had the electronics background. I was getting out the soldering gun and all that kind of stuff and uh, handle it more. So I, so I knew more of the target. And that's one of the things I would emphasize that David Lightman didn't really know his target that well. I kind of knew the targets and I was more focused on the targets. So I would say, know thy target. You know, if you're going to hack, obviously, like spear phishing would be one example today. But I mean, in a general sense, really try and understand that target. So that's kind of where, uh, where I came from. Uh, and that's how I got involved with them in the movie. And then you would, um, you would have these conversations, and would they say, would, would they ask for technical input, or would they just give you big generalities like, do you think it would be possible to break into a defense system? Or would they give you kind of help us draw connected dots to an idea we already have, mm. using your technical experience to backfill someplace they were going to get to no matter what? Or did you help them get to where... Yeah. No, I helped him get to it. There was a place on uh, Sunset Boulevard. Green Tree Productions is where uh, War Games was originally written. It was originally called The Genius, but that really means nothing because that would apply to everybody here. That's an IQ of 120 or above. So, you know, that's everybody in this audience. So, but that was, they weren't too good on titles. None of us were too good on titles. So that was the original screenplay. and was sold to Universal. Universal bought it, and it was uh, problematic. It wasn't easy selling it. And then it was sold to Disney. Disney had no clue what to do with it. And then Disney sold it to MGM, which ultimately made it into the movie. But Universal first bought the screenplay called The Genius. 
and the very, even I would say, and the original screenplay, you guys would love the original screenplay. I am actually going to ask to see if we can have that just put online because it's much more accurate in the hacking. Uh, John Badham, who was the director, that year also did Blue Thunder. And John Badham likes to sensationalize things. So, and of course, you know, it's a movie too, right? So it has to be a little more sensational than it might be in a book or in a screenplay. So you guys will like the screenplay. The screenplay is dead on on the hacking. Okay, there's no question about that. And even where AI and hacking kind of come together, and that's what I'm still involved with. Matter of fact, before I forget, let me just, just uh, I mentioned this to Jeff, that uh, I'm launching a blog in, in kind of memory of all this, and it's zerodaydefense.net. And I'm really going to be looking at AI meets, uh, and AI in a very generic sense, including genetic algorithms, uh, fuzzy systems, neural nets, meets uh, InfoSec. So it's really a combination of those. So, so yeah, we actually worked and plotted out the original plot. I thought the original plot that you saw in the, that you ultimately wound up in the movie was too simple. So we pushed this idea of having space-based weapon systems. Now, I realize retrospectively that seems kind of stupid, but if you look back at, if you think of things in the context of 79, space-based weapon systems were a really hot topic. So it was, uh, it was an area that was very, this is even before Reagan came in with SDI. It was a very hot topic then. And it was an area that the U.S. was really afraid that we were going to lose to the Soviet Union. So there was a big push for this. But then ultimately the screenplay in, in that form was just too complicated. It was just, you know, like, like how do you get David up in it as an astronaut? It's just like, oh, this is stupid. So, so, so it just became too ridiculous and then it got pretty much where you saw it here, except again, on the screenplay, it's a lot more accurate, and then Batum dazzled it up. Would you say um, the movie uh, Colossus, The Forbin Project, influenced anything? The Forbin Project, I think, influenced probably them, but that's a really good question, and this has to do with the AI aspect versus the hacking aspect, I think. Larry and Walter had more of an AI aspect to it, and I didn't. I had more of a hacker aspect to it. I was more interested in that than I was in the AI part. They were more interested in the AI part. And I've been very skeptical, and I went to my first Hitchcock conference, I say, before California became a state. So, you know, and I've been very disappointed with AI over the years. And I do see agent-based systems having some validity and certainly neural controllers and control systems and such. But overall, AI has been overhyped. I mean, way, way, way overhyped. And then I see things like transhumanism now and the Singularity Institute and everything that Kurzweil writes. And, you know, and I pretty much say, well, okay, well, maybe it's inspirational, right. even if it's totally bogus. You know, it might be inspirational, just like popular science and future shock were inspirational to me. They don't have to necessarily be accurate. They can be inspirational. So, uh, so I didn't really, you know, so the AI part kind of was more their angle. I was more interested in the hacking side. No, I, there, there's a reason I ask about the Colossus because it's one of my favorite se series of books and favorite uh, movies, and there seems to be only few seminal points that everybody uh, drew inspiration from, and uh, and I thought that was kind of slow for its time. Now, now in its time, it would be incredibly slow, but it dealt with a lot of the same issues. It was the first, uh, I think, it was the first movie where a computer becomes intelligent and decides it knows what's best. It's going to take over. Uh, control the nuclear systems to basically blackmail the world into peace. This is sort of the opposite, um, but the same idea with a, an intelligent computer that knows what's best. Um, so I can't think of where that thread has taken us, but it was definitely, at its time, that seemed to be a very hot concept. Yeah, the Forbin Project was certainly, I mean, I had seen it, but again, it wasn't as influential on me. I think it was very influential on Larry in particular. Not so much Walter. I would say Larry, though, was very influential. But, but from there, I don't think we've seen very many uh, super intelligent computer movies. Um, I think that idea, much like uh, the space base, has kind of faded. Um, anyway, so that was kind of where we came from. The movie was created. Did you ever think it would be on screen? Did you think it would ever see the day of light? You know, the first year, the light of day? Yeah, after we wrote it, it was just like nobody's buying into this thing. And it took a long time by Hollywood standards to get this thing made. So uh, that's why I mentioned when you asked me how I've been involved with anything else they've done. And that's when they started writing sneakers. So about a year after War Games began, uh, the, the writing of war games, right about early 1980, they, they really were just trying to pitch war games. So they started writing sneakers. 
And then they started writing sneakers over at 20th Century Fox. Uh, they were at the studios there writing that. So uh, I actually don't remember who made sneakers, whether 20th Century Fox made it or not, but that's where they wrote the screenplay for that. And I, so I was just a little bit involved with that. That was more of a, they wanted that to really be more of a physical security movie than it really turned out to be. But it, but it was really more about physical security originally in the concept for sneakers. So then, uh, so then the movie comes out. What do you do? Throw a party? Well, uh, you know, m my life kind of... Uh, went in a different direction. I wound up getting involved with robotics for the biotech industry. So I kind of put a lot of this stuff behind me. And although I always had an interest, I think old hackers never die. They either become marketing or sales guys or technical project leads or managers. You know? but, but there's no way, I really do think, as I've noticed, it would be tough to compete the 20-somethings. You know? They can just do things tactically that somebody at 50 is not going to really be able to do in general. I think, but, but then there's different skills you have at a, at a different age. So, um, so I kind of put that behind me, and the biotech side was, and robotics is pretty interesting. Then I sold my soul uh, to the devil and wound up in Samsung as director of strategic <laughs> planning for AST. For those of you who are old enough to remember AST, yeah, I was the head of, I was director of strategic planning for AST, which basically meant downsizing. So the Koreans told me basically to kill the company with the uh, CEO, and that's what happened. And then I wound up at Microsoft, and then I went from Microsoft wait, wait, to... Wait, isn't that the place you sold your soul to? Well, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's a good question. Because uh, from Microsoft, I went to Oracle. And I tell people going from Microsoft to Oracle was like going from Christianity to Islam, but I was a nuclear arms jihadist at Oracle. and Because Oracle, I was in a great position at Oracle, and the money was unbelievably good. Yeah, and, I, and actually, I was at Microsoft and Oracle, both companies, when they reached their all-time stock highs. So th the environments were very good. Oracle has a reputation for being very Darwinian, but we had a 5,000 headcount increase while I was at Oracle. So then after Oracle, I was in um, uh, Microsoft, it was channels, and Oracle, I was director of e-business at Oracle, uh, the first director of e-business at Oracle. And then I was VP of e-business strategies at the Meta Group. I remember some guy here who was earlier on a panel was with Gartner, but I don't know what level he was at. I was a VP of e-business at Meta, and then, of course, e-business was a four-letter word. And I was at ground zero during the nuclear winter of Silicon Valley. So that pretty much, really, pretty much destroyed my life in 2002. I mean, it's like Murphy's Law was too optimistic. Things went wrong that I couldn't even have imagined went wrong with my life in 2002. So, it's a, so it was kind of a tough recovery period. So then China. Then China. So then, uh, so everybody wants to know, what brought you to China? That's the question I usually get asked. And here's a great answer, because it, it's true. It's absolutely true. Online dating. <laughs> Somebody was doing something about uh, Adult Friend Finder, but Adult Friend Finder has uh, several other sites. One of them is Asia Friend Finder. And I used that, and I was... Um, you know, the Asians, uh, the Chinese, well, Asian friend finder is like 99% Chinese because there's a Filipino friend finder and a Korean friend finder, so they have their own friend finders. So uh, it's really 99% Chinese. And my, uh, my ex is Chinese, so I have just, I guess, kind of a, an attraction to Chinese women. So uh, this turned out pretty good. I picked the top five women I wanted to meet. I had all these frequent flyer miles accumulated from all my travels at Oracle and Microsoft. So um, I basically called up United Airlines at one time. I was living in Silicon Valley then. And I called up United Airlines, said, the next Saturday I want to go. I went to the San Francisco consulate for the Chinese embassy, the Chinese consulate, got my visa, off I went, and pretty much I've been there since. I mean, I literally, within like a week, Went to China. I had to come back because it was a 30-day visa, so I came back, did laundry, went back. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's what you have to do. It takes a little time. For Chinese visas, you have to go, like, go so many times before they, they extend your visa. And then I got sponsored by uh, – and then I had to figure out what am I going to do in China? You know, what am I going to do in China? So then because of my background at Oracle and such, uh, I wound up being VP of Biz Dev for the two largest Chinese uh, outsourcing companies that are focused on the U.S. One of them went public. They wanted to be the Infosys of China. They didn't quite happen. They have a 100 million market cap, hardly what Infosys is at. But nevertheless, I did that. Out of, 20, out of 2,000 people, there were 20 VPs, and I was the only person not born in China. So it wasn't even, they didn't even have any ethnic Chinese or Taiwanese or Hong Kongese. Everybody was born in China except for me. So that was quite an experience. How long did it take to learn the language? Uh, you know, I learn about two words a year. 
<laughs> so uh, I, know, I know what I call survival Chinese. I can tell cab drivers how to drive, and I can order in restaurants. And I always have somebody on 24-7 on cell phones to, uh, to help communicate. And I've been all over the country, uh, 25 software parks in China, the 25 largest software parks. And I actually, if you do a search on my name, David Scott Lewis, you'll see all sorts of stuff, all, mostly on IT outsourcing in China. I don't really want to be known for that, but it seems that's kind of where I kind of got pigeonholed. So, uh, so, so then one day, what, you get a call from Wired and they say, hey, it's the 25th year uh, retrospective. What do you have to say for yourself? Or is it more like uh, it came from a different direction? Uh, well, they actually contacted Larry, Walt Larry Walter, John Badham, the director, uh, Peter Schwartz. Peter Schwartz was very influential to Larry and Walter. Does everybody know who Peter Schwartz is? Peter Schwartz is with the Global Business Network. He was at SRI back then. Uh, GBN now is owned by Monitor, which is Michael Porter's operation from the Harvard Business School. Uh, they're, um, they got, he got kind of tied in. You can even, matter of fact, this is actually a good point on how Larry and Walter were thinking about the movie. When they went to SRI, now for those of you over 50, this is a quiz. <laughs> who, over, who would be the one person you would think of in that time frame from SRI in computer security. I mean, to everybody that was in InfoSec back then, he was, the, he was on your mind. There were two people in the whole world that you'd know, and he's one of the two. Okay, Don Parker. Don Parker. And then the other one was Willis Ware at the Rand Corporation. Well, you know, Willis was close by because Larry lived in Santa Monica and so did Walter lived in Westwood back then. Yeah, he lived in Westwood back then. So they were pretty close. So they did a lot with Willis Ware at the Rand Corporation. And I think Willis was probably their key kind of, uh, kind of setting a framework for, for what could be done. Whereas I'm the guy that kind of said, you know, this is how the kid should react and what he should do and how he would hack. So, and then uh, one, Duncan Wilmore, the guy that, uh, that you see in the movie, he's, he's the guy that doesn't lock out, he locks out the missiles. He was their key consultant from the military. He was the Air Force liaison at the uh, federal building on Wilshire Boulevard in L.A. So he got actually a part in the movie, and, and he, was, he was pretty in instrumental from that part of the movie. So then, but Wired, the, how did the article come out? Oh, so Wired. So uh, uh, the guy who wrote it, Scott Brown, contacted, uh, contacted them in May, and then... And Larry, uh, I haven't seen Larry since October 2004 when I was back from a trip from China. And we don't, he changed his email address, and so I couldn't find him and just tried different things that didn't bounce and so on. So I, I, but I still know his phone number by memory. I mean, I, I even gave you that, his phone number. But, uh, but they, they, somehow he found me. The guy was, I'm pretty easy to find on the internet if you use my full name. So he just tracked me down. And he tracked me down in early June and wanted me in the article. Yeah, there's only a few people in the article. As I said, the directors, myself, Larry and Walter, Peter Schwartz, because he was kind of giving that philosophical perspective to things. Uh, Kevin Mitnick is quoted. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> Captain Crunch is quoted. I don't know why. And then the other person that's quoted is the head of the Air Force Cyber Security Space Command or the something. Yeah. The new one. Yeah. yeah. And he, he was also quoted in the Wired article as well. Matter of fact, what's funny is, just a little aside, is that NORAD is actually, back then, was very tiny. I mean, it was very, it was like a little cave. And after seeing war games, they said, that's what we want. <laughs> so, so they made it. Now it looks like war games. Or so I'm told. I haven't been there since. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't know. If you can pay the hazmat bill. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's kind of the background. That's how we got here. I'd like to open it up for any questions. And Priest is the first one with his hand up. Did you ever read the of P1? Oh, did, oh, The question man. is, did you did, ever read the I, Adolescence oh, of P1? Jeez. Oh. Oh, okay, okay. This is like, I, I must have paid you to ask this because I forgot this. Because remember, it was in right, the notes right, I we sent to you. We were thinking who to pay to ask in, questions, yeah. The, yeah, it was in the notes I sent to you. <laughs> <laughs> the adolescence of P1 had to be the most influential piece of fiction that I ever read. And if you haven't read it, buy it. I don't know how you can get it. I still have a copy. Priest has it pirated on priestwares. We can do it in China. <laughs>
priest is stalking him. Uh, scary. scary. Okay, as far as the movie, I never, I didn't even know there was a movie. No, I never even saw the movie, so I have only, I've only read the book. Uh, I thought the premises were okay for back then, because back then, remember, we were living in, a, uh, in an age of Hal. So we're having adolescents of P1 kind of competing against the, the Hal 9000. So in that sense, it seemed more realistic <laughs> than... Yeah, I thought it was... Uh, yeah, I, I thought it was... Well, think about just software agents. Okay, so in essence, the adolescence of P1. And the software agents get smarter and smarter. So, yeah, and the, well, and learning. You don't think that, say, the Demon Seed movie wasn't a better biological imperative of the computer? <laughs> Yeah, so if you haven't read it, yeah, so I, I would, oh, that was just an absolutely wonderful book. Yeah, and thank you for bringing that up because I totally forgot about that. Adolescence P1, absolutely wonderful. Yeah, please. So the, yeah, okay. so the question was, uh, can you explain a bit of his hacking skills and what inspired the movie? Yes, most of the stuff was, well, one thing is, is that back then, I remember there was a session today where he talked about the, the top words and such, and, and it was really easy back then. So, I mean, people really were dumb. And the way they used the passwords, like pencil, and they showed pencil here, it was that easy to get into things. So if you were doing war dialing, of course, we didn't call it war dialing. Then war dialing came from the movie War Games, okay, the etymology of the word. But uh, maybe DEF CON came from war games. Anyway. So... Uh, so it was very easy. So the, getting into the passwords, as long as you could get in and make the modem connection, was not very difficult at all. Uh, th then some of my stuff was related to DOD, but let's say in cooperation with rather than against. So it was in cooperation with. Now also there's certain things I can't talk about because of where I live. Okay, so that's just, it, it's not been, a, plus also, honestly, it, that stuff is a long time ago. So from a perspective of using the internet today for what we're doing and penetrations and such, it's a whole different reality. But I mean, would you say something? Oh, by the way, one thing I got to say, because I, I got to say this, is that Captain Crunch is here. He'll, he'll get pissed off. And some people that are, that are really heavy and freakers will, will, will uh, get pissed off at this. But I got to say, I always felt that was a, just, a, 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 just a tool. It was more of a trick. Well, more of even of a trick. You know, doing freaking was a trick. Doing war dialing was a trick. It wasn't, to me, it was just the point of... the end game. That it was wasn't. The, yeah. the end game was the hacking. Yeah. It was just a matter of getting you to the point. And I was really surprised that Captain Crunch, I mean, he's a good self-promoter. I mean, he's good at that. John's good at that. And I think, and just to, to, in 2600 Magazine and all that, it's just, I don't know. I, I, that did surprise me that that became such a big deal. And now you look today, does that, does anybody care? I mean, certainly the magazine exists. I, I don't well, care. Well, now you've got VoIP connections for free. So yeah, what's so the I point? mean, what, what, you know, a whole different world. No, there was a lot more hacking in the screenplay. Oh, well, let me repeat the question. So I guess to, to, to paraphrase, uh, was uh, there's the hacking was shown, the movie kind of goes off in a different direction, didn't seem to be totally consistent in what, what's being shown. Uh, I would say that uh, the screenplay is consistent. The screenplay is very consistent. Matter of fact, there's no stupid whopper in the, uh, in the, in the screenplay. It's PSYOP. It's the Strategic Integrated Operating Plan, which is still the war plan for the United States in the event of a global thermonuclear conflict. Okay, and that's what we called it. Okay, and we just had that kind of computer. Yeah, there was, it was put into a computer, which is based on a model on a cray. Remember, we're looking in the time frame of 19, early 80s. So, is, or, or, or CDC or whatever, you know, you're big, one of those Minneapolis companies that was in the supercomputing business, that, which of course don't exist uh, for the most part. So, um, 
So anyways, the, the screenplay was really much more accurate in what it was showing and how to get there. And, and Sneakers, I thought, in some ways did a better job of showing some of that. Uh, although Sneakers had, I think, a lot of other issues with it. Yeah, people actually got shot in that movie. In yeah. Sneakers, that was just kind of off on a whole other tangent. Yeah, you know, Larry and Walter will tell you this and because they've told me this. They love doing war games. War games was, uh, and one thing I would say, I've, I noticed here, because, and they talked about this. Um, all of us, I think, share a deep passion for what we're doing and for all of this. And, and they had a passion for war games, too. Sneakers was a job. Larry and Walter, if you ask them that, they'll just say to you, sneakers was a job. Some of the actors that were in there, we won't mention names, were kind of a pain in the ass to work with uh, for sneakers. And that wasn't the case with War Games. War Games, there were issues because they got kicked off the movie with a director and then they replaced the director with Badham. So there was, an, there was a time frame there where they were actually off War Games. But uh, that didn't last long. But War Games was a passion for them, for all of us. And sneakers was really just a job. Question o the question over here with the lady. Oh, oh, absolutely. No, it's funny yes. because I, I, I can't find one in Vegas. It seems like nobody has a – nobody reads in Vegas. We've got a couple other CD – we have some other DVDs yeah. as well that we're going to have him yeah, sign at the end. Yeah. Re-envisioning oh. war games today. One of the things I, I, I want to say when we're all done with the questions, I want to float a movie idea to you that I've discussed with Larry. We haven't discussed this with Walter yet. But Walter is now kind of independent and would have time to act and ha certainly has the clout with his credentials to put something together. So I'll kind of address your question when I give you the movie pitch because I think that answers your question. And there was a gentleman over here. Yeah, okay, yeah, the question that, is, why do the UIs suck in almost every movie, and they re-envision them to be, yeah, is it they have to simplify to such a basic point so the viewer can only read one line, that's all they get? Yeah, that probably, um, that's probably one of my pet peeves, too. Uh, you th see 3D uh, visualization, immersive VR, that's such, and we know what it's like. Right. We're on command lines, and they're doing immersive VR. What a, what a disconnect from reality of hacking, right? right? I mean, <laughs> We're a dial-up in there at Lawnmower Man. Yeah, it's just stupid. <laughs> yeah, Lawnmower Man. Lawnmower Man, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's just goofy stuff. Yeah, I think it's just bogus, but if I look at what would happen with war games, like you notice that they had the speech synthesis. Now, who has speech synthesis here, okay, to do when they're, when they're doing your hack? Nobody does that. But, of course, it's a cute movie ploy. And, you know, and that I don't think was so bad, right, because it's just well, the I synthesis. think then that's like he had a Heath kit and he was showing off his latest build. And, yeah, you know. yeah, you know, I didn't think that was so bad as when you get into the immersive VR and you're moving things. Oh, that's just so stupid. Yeah, so I don't, I don't like that stuff either. Now, after the movie Hackers got hacked, I did end up talking to the, uh, the producer uh, no, the writer, and he was actually happy that it got hacked, and he was saying that um, the reason they had all that crazy flyby visuals is that they spent so much time trying to watch real hackers, and they couldn't find a way to portray, like, 22 hours of people with no sleep in Mountain Dew. <laughs> and they're like, well, we were going to fast forward through all this stuff and show clocks spinning, and like, no, that's not going to work. And they tried a million different ideas, and they figured, it's a new movie, we'll just go in a completely direc different direction, we'll just do this weird psycho visual flyby, and that was their way of trying to show time, space, difficulty, uh, and commitment. Didn't really work. People deride that. But they at least tried to show a different direction of, of how do you portray intellectual activity without putting people to sleep. And, and again, that's a movie ploy. So I understand why it's done. I don't particularly like it. And it certainly gives an inaccurate view of how we actually do things. But I do understand that from that perspective. There's another uh, gentleman back here, I believe, had a question. No? Nope. Anybody over here? Okay, okay, how about the China? i got to tell you the China angle, though, before I tell the pitch. Okay, China angle first, then pitch. Yeah, then, then the pitch. So the China angle always comes up. What's going on? And I'm going to kind of summarize this. Uh, now, the caveat is I have been affiliated with Tsinghua University. I still am, actually. If you go on, the company starts at global.com. 
Uh, they're actually the outsourcing operation for Tsinghua. Tsinghua is the MIT of China. Most of the major leadership in China at this time went to Tsinghua, including President Hu Jintao. Uh, that's not true in 2012, which is where the movie comes in. They're going to have a completely different leadership in 2012. So China is going to be a very interesting company to watch, a country to watch, in 20, especially in 2012. Not this Olympics. Forget the Olympics. 2012 is going to be the, the time. So uh, with China and the hacking situation, uh, there's, a, there's the dark visitor. Is the dark visitor here? The guy who writes the Dark Visitor blog, there is a blog that covers it a little bit. Um, I was with some DOE guys because my day job these days is in the solar industry. And we have a Spanish company. We're raising about uh, 5 to 10 million euros in Hong Kong. And I spent about fourth of my time in Hong Kong, about 7 to 10 days a, a, a month in Hong Kong. And I live in a city called Qingdao, which is in between Beijing and Shanghai. And we actually will have the, uh, the sailing events and the... Uh, windsurfing for the Olympics. Uh, actually, the Olympics this year is in several cities in China, not just in Beijing. Uh, they did it kind of differently. So, uh, you know, things will be done by China, but it's not clear when I talk to my DOE contacts that whether they're being set up, whether we're seeing how much they can actually get. Uh, obviously, do we do it to them? The Chinese press would never report that. Okay, so it, it's probably like a cat and mouse game that's played both ways. Uh, so to what extent it's done, who knows. The, but the, well, the key area is on uh, asymmetric warfare. The Chinese realize that if they do come to battle with us, and hopefully that will never happen, but if that happens, or with al-Qaeda, asymmetric warfare is critical because it's hard to beat the U.S. one-on-one -on -one militarily were basically impossible to beat. So you have to use asymmetric warfare. Information warfare is a key component of that. So if you can, and of course Al-Qaeda, we all know Al-Qaeda is very good at hacking, okay, and very good at using exploits and such. So, and rec recruiting. So, um, so all of this is, is occurring, and China's, I think, following along really in no, no different way than most other countries, including the United States, are following relative to who they may view as potential adversaries. So I'm not, uh, I write for the Letter of China column for the Sand Hill Group and for Always On Network, and I can be pretty, pretty critical of China, but I can also be, I, I think I'm pretty objective too. And the current leadership's pretty good. You have to understand they're going through a lot of, there's a lot of chaos in the country. It's, uh, I tell people when I go, when I fly from the United States to China, it's like going through a wormhole, and I don't go to a different country, I go to a different planet. Because r the way we reason just, it's different there. I tell people it's a great way. You're married. Okay, I'm married. Uh, anybody that's married, don't. Oh, well, great. <laughs> great. Hey. Don't, don't try to uh, understand your wife. Just learn to accept your wife. And that's what it really is like in China. Just learn to accept what happens. You, you kind of predict the guy's going to drive, the cab driver's going to use the sidewalk to save time. So you better move out of the way. Just all sorts of goofy things. Oh, I, I got to tell you two, two quick China stories that are just, just great because they're good to laugh at. Uh, in the winter, this one was best winter story this last winter. How do you, your car has trouble starting, right? How do you get your engine block warmed up? Easy. Get a pile of bushes, get brushed together, light it on fire, and stick it underneath your engine block. Okay? And I, when, it, when it happened when I was with an American visitor this year, I didn't even pay attention to it. So it shows that maybe I've been in China too long because <laughs> it didn't even phase me. And then the other one this year, the funny one this year that we're seeing more of is that there's more and more Western toilets coming in. And they actually have instructions on what to do. And the instructions are, don't stand on the rim. And the other one is, don't face the plunger. Because if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Face the plunger. You know, if you're going one way, just do that. So, uh, you know, it's different. It's really, but one thing I can say is there's dynamism in China. It feels like 1999 in Silicon Valley. There's a dynamism, and there's a lot of nationalism. That's the downside. But you'll also see, uh, I'm not too worried about it. The Chinese are, you know, you'll, you'll see the, the mother who is dressed in her Mao outfit with her daughter who's drop-dead gorgeous wearing short shorts and the latest fashions and makeup, and it's absolutely hilarious. And this has only happened now in the last couple of years in China, where you see, you see the, ma the mom still dressed like in the Cultural Revolution, and the daughter is just hot. So, so, <laughs> so how is the uh, Great Ch Firewall of China treating you? Uh, you know, the Great Firewall of China, first of all, I tell everybody you got a, a VPN. Right? So you have to get a VPN to get around, otherwise you're just stuck. You're really hosed, especially with blogs. So you really don't have any choice. I use, you know, I think most of us use Ytopia. 
so because that's probably the best cost benefit. Some people use Tor, but Tor from China, it's, yeah, it's as slow as mud. So using so using using Tor from China is pretty bad. Now Anchor Free, some people are using Anchor Free. Now they're trying to use that, so uh, that gets them around. They get their stupid little advertisements, but that's okay. They don't use it often. It's more in Starbucks. The Starbucks are all, they're all free Wi-Fi. So uh, they do that. There's Starbucks, by the way, and Pizza Hut in China are much, much better than here. Just no comparison. No comparison. They're nice. They're really nice. Yeah. I'm sorry. I can't hear a word you're saying. Could you, could you maybe come up? said so the uh, media coverage during uh, the earthquake was very open. Yes, it was open primarily because of what just happened prior to the, uh, the problems in one of their neighbors. So, uh, so that was one of the reasons. Also, Wen Jiaobao really took charge of this operation, and he's, uh, he's really good. Wen Jiaobao is, is quite good. Uh, Hu Jintao is, okay, is pretty good, but Wen Jiaobao, they're, they're lucky. They have, the two top guys are technocrats. And China needs technocrats. The guys coming in at 2012 are attorneys. Oh, God. The downfall of China. So who knows? But they speak English, and they spend time in the States. So we'll have to see what happens. I'm sorry, say what? Are there any big disadvantages to living in China? You know, I tell people that if, if there is a purgatory, I hope I'm getting credit for time lived in China. So I would say there's lots of disadvantages to living in China. Uh, I mean, food, for one thing. I mean, just the food, just, you can't, you know, I crave an In-N-Out burger when I come back. You know, just certain things like that. And, and culturally, it's just, uh, the nightclubs are good. I mean, the nightclubs are pretty good. There's techno ambient trance in the nightclubs and so on, and it's, that, that's kind of good. They actually have floors that move because they joke that that's the only way you can get Chinese people to dance. So <laughs> you actually have floors that, that yeah, it's, wow. it's pretty funny. So it's, uh, and they do dance, cause, but you know, you can't, you're all kind of squeezed together. So yeah, there's lots of disadvantages. That, about, that's a whole story. I, I need your opinion on this one. I was reading a pre-Olympic story, and they're talking about these chefs that go over to China, and they check out the local markets because they want to cook fresh for their teams from their country, and they analyze a chicken wing that could feed a family of 10. I don't know a chicken wing that can be that big. And if you eat it, you'll test positive for steroids. Does that uh, kind of – have you seen the super chicken? Yeah, well, the, the, yeah, okay, the super chicken. You know, food stuff and pharmaceuticals are a key problem. I'm not, I don't want to turn this into a China talk because that would be easy to do. And it probably might be more interesting too. But food stuffs and pharmaceuticals are a huge problem for Chinese. And because we know – and that's a huge concern for the foreigners living there because we know we get junk. We know, matter of fact, the Sichuan earthquake, the reason there were a lot of deaths in all likelihood was because the materials used were substandard. They weren't what was contracted. Now, one could argue, if you look at Transparency International, India and China are among the two most corrupt countries in the world. But the one difference is, if, you, uh, if your brother-in-law in China, you give him money to build a road, you'll have a road. If your brother-in-law in India, you give him money, you probably won't have a road. So, you know, the corruption is more efficient in China. Uh, <laughs> But still, they're substandard things. You know, people in cash flow, businesses run in China on cash flow. They run on razor-thin margins. So any little thing they can cut, they will. And even when we do business in China, we're a Spanish company, so I can say this. I'm not, I'm not obligated to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the United States. We have to pay our salespeople to give them bribe money to the purchasing people who we know are then going to give a kickback to our sales guy. That's, just, that's doing business in China. You know, and it's why should our way be right? You know, we're in a different country. We're in a different culture. My wife thinks it's going to take two to three generations before it's going to change. And it isn't just about IP. You know, Huawei is generally regarded, generally regarded, okay, I'll legally make that claim, generally regarded as basically having ripped off Cisco technology to create their company. Now Huawei sues their former Chinese, you know, their Chinese employees who have left that rip off their technology. <laughs> and so it isn't just against Western firms, it's against each other. If you've got an idea, an IP, it's mine too. 
we're a collective nation. So, so, so that's just a cultural thing that's going to take time to change. There was a question, I think, over here. Okay, and then we'll go to your movie pitch. Yeah, okay. Okay, sir? Yep. No, I have not, and I really don't have a lot of interest seeing it. I had zero involvement. I saw the trailer for it, and it, just like the Andromeda Strain, I think this year in the States had a... Oh, boo. Oh, man. I, I, when, I, when I saw what it was like, I, I said, I don't even want to see this. I just want to have... Sort of in-name only movies. Oh, yeah. God. So, no, no, I haven't seen it, and, and if you give me a free DVD, I, I may consider... Well, you know, it is funny, yeah. The DVDs, we, we pay uh, seven kwai, so that's about a dollar for a DVD. But you want to know something, though? And this is in the defense of China we wouldn't know where to buy a legal DVD. So, like people say, you know, what are you going to do? And it's like, you can't buy legal DVDs. You have to pay a buck to get your illegal DVD. Damn it. You, damn it, yeah, really. What are you going to do? Because we'll get bored. We only have one English channel. So that's Channel 9 and that's CCTV, and it's mostly kind of like CNN, uh, the Chinese version of CNN. So, you know, that gets a little like bored. White Devil is having heavy rain in Northern California. Yeah, yeah. And the Channel 5 is the, the uh, sports channel, which is basically soccer and basketball, which I don't particularly care for either. So, Okay, movie idea. Movie idea. Okay, yeah. so let, let's toss this out. And I wanted to put this on my laptop just so I don't forget anything. So let me just kind of just, uh, read it to you. Just, uh, if you like it, hey, we might actually have this as a movie. And if you don't like it, well, then I guess we'll, we'll let it die. Uh, basic plot. Uh, it's trying to bring in some different types of elements into the plot. So it's a covert... Interpol operation in China to thwart Russian organized crime elements working with Al-Qaeda in China. Al-Qaeda does exist in China. Okay? Matter of fact, the main reason that the Tibetans will not get more independence is because of Al-Qaeda. And you never hear that from the Western media, do you? Because if they give it to the Tibetans, they've got to give it to the Uyghurs. And if they give it to the Uyghurs, who are all Muslim, it's not going to happen. Okay? I actually support Beijing's position on Tibet. I think they're a little heavy-handed. But overall, I understand why they cannot give Tibet. the kind Because the Buddhists, the Tibetan Buddhists, want democracy. That's not viable in China now. Okay? You have to live there and see. They would vote for a Hitler, too, in China. If you had the villagers and the citizens and the way they operate and such, you could convince the poor people with the big income disparities that there are in China to vote for a Hitler. That's not in our best interest, and it's not in their best interest. Okay? It, you, know, you, you have to really understand and see what, on ground level what's happening in China. But anyway, let's go back to this. So, Russian organized crime, hacker types, right? And now they want to figure out, hey, I need to do something with the money. Hey, this uh, Xinjiang province, uh, Xinjiang Autonomous Region, which is Uyghurs, Muslims, I'll run, there's Al-Qaeda elements there. Uh, you may have heard about this last week, actually. The PLA went in and wiped out one group, and they did that about six months ago. The PLA doesn't screw around. When they go in there, they just blow them away. Okay? There's no, like, civil rights, we're going to read you or put you in Gitmo. We're just going to kill you all. Okay? So the, the PLA is pretty, pretty strong with them. And uh, same with other Muslim extremists uh, in, in the region. So this takes place in 2012 when there's new leadership in China. The new leadership has found evidence of corruption, which is a huge problem, and they can't really trust who they can really go to to really solve this problem because there's this independence movement in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region, the Uyghurs, just like in Tibet now. Uh, so they request a covert operation by Interpol. So the bad guys are the Russian organized crime and al-Qaeda in China. The good guys, guess what? It's David Lightman at 50 years old. But, <laughs> but, okay, okay. But, but we'll, we'll take this further. And there's going to be uh, three different other types, too. There would be a white Silicon Valley hacker, a Chinese hacker from Beijing, and a beautiful Indian hacker from Bangalore, female. Uh, hacker from interest. Bangalore. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. I have, we haven't thought that through yet. So the Silicon Valley Chinese and the Indian hackers in their mid to late 20s, and Lightman's been living in China for five years out of Interpol for the past 10. He's being recruited for the special assignment kind of just to lead this team of younger hackers. Most of the action takes place in Shanghai. I thought MI3 did a horrible job in showing Shanghai. Mission Impossible 3 just did an awful job in showing Shanghai. So I was very disappointed with that. Show more scenes in Shanghai with additional locations 
kind of in that James Bond kind of thing with Moscow, Urumqi, which is where the Ouija's would be primarily, uh, Mountain View, Silicon Valley, Beijing, Bangalore, Dubai, and Hong Kong. Primarily Dubai and Hong Kong for money laundering stuff. So uh, the bad guys are using the internet for uh, various nefarious acts and uh, an attacks plan on Shanghai during a SCO meeting. That's the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is Russia, China, a few other countries. But, then, uh, but most of the action really takes place on the internet. And then there's a bombing plan for the SCO meeting to try to get independence for the uh, Xinjiang Autonomous Region. APEC hel holds a meeting. We'll try to work that and explain it in easy ways. And what's in it for the Russians, as I said, they want the mineral assets in Xinjiang Autonomous Region if it becomes independent. They want it for themselves. So it's really, in simple terms then, uh, it would be Chloe is the good guy. Not Jack Bauer helps Chloe rather than Chloe helping Jack Bauer. So the hero's the Chloe character. And there has to be a Jack Bauer character at the end because there is a bombing plan for Shanghai. But really it's the, the hackers, really the, the heroes in this. We've also talked about it from a sense of how much hacking. That there would be more hacking, we would guarantee more hacking than in any hacking movie to date, and it would be realistic. Matter of fact, we would maybe, it be fat free? You can even get Jeff. It's like it has to, in priest, get, get like a, a certain criteria. You know, it has to go through a committee to get approved as to the, the hacking level. We want it to be very accurate uh, as far as the hacking elements concerned. No, but no, you're going to run into the same problems every movie's had is how do you uh, visualize that hacking? More than just a, you know, an end map, screen map, and ooh, I'm in. Well, probably more like 24, except that obviously it won't be that you take 256 bit encryption and uh, figure it out in three seconds. So, yeah. so, so probably not that kind of element that you see in 24, but more of kind of the 24-ish element. I think that the way they show Chloe and her team on uh, 24 does an okay job. Uh, they do it things too quickly, you know, as, as we would all agree. It's you know too quick. Hey, they only got 24 hours, uh, um, but but that kind of a kind of a situation. Because again, it's an Interpol secret operation. So does this? So so we're trying to bring in Interpol, more information on Interpol. But now Al Qaeda, the whole bit. So in war games, the stakes are pretty high. It was the whole world. It was the whole planet. Mm -hmm. In this movie, what's the stakes? What happens if they lose? A bomb goes off in front of a building? Uh, the bomb actually would kill several uh, heads of state because the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization in APEC would have world leaders from the U.S., England, you know, the, basically the G8, many other countries uh, would be there. Would be, right. would but be so, so you're going to take out some leaders from, from other countries? Yeah, main, main leaders. And then will China. that have trigger some other secondary? Russia will get what they want then? or uh, Russia loses out in this and other parts of the plot, uh, and, uh, or TBD. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, it could be. You know, the dirty bomb would be kind of the plot from, uh, what was the, uh, the Tom Clancy movie in the book? Uh, the the, the oh, Some of All Fears? Some of All Fears, yeah. Some of All Fears, yeah. I like the book better than the movie, but, yeah. You know, uh, that, that, that's probably a good question. You know, if you look at a lot of movies, if a lot of movies do have the premise that some for, uh, a major leader is going to die and be assassinated. In this case, you'd have, a, you'd have Russia, China, the United States. You'd have major countries, India. You'd have all these major countries being killed at once. And the chaos that could possibly cause. Oh, I'm sorry. It was like, why do we care if a foreign leader gets killed or a, a foreign dignitary? <laughs> Who needs him? Yeah. I don't know. That's good, because, you know, we, we need, well, we'll need a lot of iterations. Trust me, in war games, there were so many iterations that we had to go through and things to think through and people that we talked with and said, no, you can't do this or that or whatever, as far as plots, or too, too extravagant from a movie production point of view. So, uh, I, I'm sorry, so you, you, were, you were asking...
they don't know that where the bomb is, and that's where they got to find out. So that has the 24 kind of element to it, where they're trying to find where the device is so that's before how you, it goes off. You create off. the time pressure. And, and the David Lightman doesn't really necessarily have to be that way. But David Lightman's become more of the, you know, with Interpol and doing more management rather than actual. That's why the 20 somethings are the real hackers that he's managing that team. And, and David is, is like Easter eggs. It's just there for us aficionados. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, kind of. And, and, really to gu and really to guide the team. It's really to guide the team as to where thing, they should be thinking about things. Just like the blog I'm doing is, uh, you know, I can't write a blog. I don't want, nobody needs a new, uh, we, we don't need a new news blog, right, in this field. We don't need another one. And I'm not going to write tactical exploits. But I'm looking at my blogs really focusing on what to, like as, a, as an analyst in the meta group, where do we see things happening over the next three to five years? Where are the areas that products, ISVs, inter, inter, uh, independent software vendors can develop product? Where are some market needs there? So it's looking more future a little more in the future, more from a product planning point of view. Now, do you think it's realistic, though, that Interpol, China even would call Interpol? Yes, we think that's very realistic. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because China does have some problems with their own internal security, and uh, there's a lack of trust within certain elements in China and the PLA. So uh, to what extent? But that's why we're doing this in 2012, because it's a new leadership. And the new leadership doesn't have the 10 years of establishment. In China, the leadership's for 10 years. It's five years pretty much automatically renewed. So, uh, and they leave in 2012. Last week, correct. Yeah, that's exactly, in essence, what it builds on, and that's why we do it in 2012 in the future. Because right now, there technically isn't an al-Qaeda in China. There's this, there's this group that's like this with al-Qaeda, but they don't use the al-Qaeda name. We're, we're assuming that in a few years, they would be actually an, like an official part of al-Qaeda. Yeah. Uh, there's a gentleman back here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. Yeah, that's a good idea. There's always a twist, though. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. No, SCO is the Shanghai... <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, I never really made that connection there. Well, you know, Santa Cruz, no, we won't put Santa Cruz or the city or anything in the movie. No, that's a funny point, though. There was another question? I'm sorry, say, say that again. It's more of the realistic vision of Shanghai. You know, if you go to China, Shanghai is not like the rest of China. Neither is Beijing. Beijing's a little bit nationalistic. Shanghai, oh, get this for a fact. 38% of the high school students in Shanghai want to go to the, want to move to the United States. Now, that's not even including all Western countries. That's specifically the United States. 38% want to move to the United States. It's that high. Shanghai is very different than the rest of China. Yeah. And, 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 it's, and we could show, like, we have the beautiful Indian woman as one of the hackers, but we could show a lot of beautiful women in Shanghai, too. <laughs> Any other comments? And, you know, and, 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 feel free to contact me or whatever. I'd love to get your ideas as we can try to develop this. It would be fun to do this. The GA could be, it could be a G8 SCO meeting. It has to be a SCO meeting because it's, because SCO's China and Russia are the two key components of SCO. So rather than APEC, it could be G8. It could be a G8 meeting with SCO. Yeah, that's perfectly viable. Yeah. Yeah, SCO. Well, SCO is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I mean, we can't rename the acronym, but, but we'll figure out something. Any other uh, questions? By the way, I love Three Days of the Condor, the next movie that's up. That was actually influential to me as well. Uh, that, uh, that was one of my favorite movies at that time.
Uh, the reason why I'm sitting here and Jeff is not is because he's running up to his room to pick up three days of the Condor uh, and come back down. We will be starting that shortly. Uh, I think the next thing is you're going to autograph these. Yeah, I can do uh, I'm not sure where they're going to go from there. Uh, I think Jeff was also checking to see, uh, I don't know if you guys knew this, but Jeff uh, is actually expecting. Uh, so there may be a little Jeff on the way soon. Good. Um, is that his first? Is that his first? Yeah. Uh, so we'll be doing the Three Days of Condor shortly. Um, so I guess, uh, on, like I said, is there any other questions out there? Or Yes, sir. Louder, sir, please. Get Matthew Broderick to do it? No. Matthew Broderick hasn't aged at all. He couldn't, he couldn't pass for 50. I mean, I don't think I really look 50, but, but Broderick still looks like he's 30 or something. Yeah. He's about 50 now, or maybe 48. All right, thank you. Zerodaydefense.net. Round of applause for him, for gentlemen, please.